Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Kenneth, and I think some of you know me, Kenneth Ham. Um, I'm an Azure MVP. How many of you here know about Azure Functions? Okay, so quite, quite, a, quite a number of you who know Azure Functions. Um, okay, so today I'll be talking about a very interesting topic, um, which is basically doable functions. How many of you here have heard about doable functions? Oh, great. It's a great audience today. So, yes, I'll be talking about doable functions in containers. So, it's pretty much putting Azure function inside containers and why we're going to do so. I'll be talking a, a bit more on um, the, the idea of what doable functions is and then how we're going to put it in containers. So, again, in, in today's context, I think we have been, you know, in the cloud enabled world, we have been talking a lot about how companies trying to solve, uh, maximize their, their efficiency and reducing IT costs. So again, with, with this diagram, we are actually moving innovation towards a bit out of the VMs infrastructure. We're moving things into serverless. We're looking into like platform as a service, software as a service. And then serverless came in, I think, the last probably one, a couple of years ago. Actually, you know, recently, about one or two years, we're looking into how we can use it as an API gateway. You can use it as a function where it triggers methods um, you know, from your codes behind. So what we're looking at serverless platform is we're looking at a couple of items, right? So right now, your development stack, you have so many other tools uh, and monitoring that Microsoft has. And this platform allows you to actually scale up from different uh, um, services like event grid, logic apps, functions. So we're going to look into functions. And, and logic app is basically a, a UI where you can actually write code uh, I mean, a bit more of an uh, orchestrating process of, of your services using a designer, whereas functions is basically coding it um, and linking up your, your codes together. So Azure Functions, the basic, of con the basic idea of what Azure Functions is basically event-driven. So the event-driven means that when an event happens, basically it gets triggered and then Azure Functions picks it up as an input. With the input, Azure Functions then handles whatever um, computation that you have behind, and it turns out into an output. So it sends a result out as an output, whether it's to a database, whether it's to uh, HTTP response, it could be to tables, to, to event grid, and it could chain functions up together. But this primarily has a certain issues or certain questions that people have is, what happens if I have a service that requires a function talking to another function? So right now, as of today, um, this again is, is slightly, might not be as up, as updated as it is, but we have C Sharp, JavaScript, F Sharp, Java, and I think there are a couple more languages coming up like Python, and I think there's a, uh, yeah, pretty much Python is, yeah, Python, Bash, PowerShell, TypeScript. So there are some additional languages coming up, and again, like for example, if you see JavaScript, it says that, you know, Node 6.5 and 8.0. Right now, you are supporting like, I think close to Node 10.11.1 already. So a couple of ways to run uh, Azure Functions. You have, I'm going to just load everything up. Okay, so we have one consumption, having your functions serverless hosted at Azure, um, having that to just run pay as you go. You can have your app service or app service environment. So that means that you can actually put it in a container and have it deployed as an app service there. Uh, Azure Stack, and even right now we're looking at Azure Functions on-prem, means that right now I can have my functions sitting on my IoT devices, which links up to IoT Edge. Um, you can have it as a container, storing as running at on-prem, and then having the IoT Edge running, triggering events on the fly, and then sending out to the cloud for processing. So, Dover Functions is pretty much the, the, the main focus of what we're going to talk about today. So that's why I'm skipping some of the Azure function basics and, and, and whatnot. Doable functions is a really interesting topic where we are talking about having processes running at a longer term, uh, being more doable. So long running functions while maintaining local state. So when I talk about having functions being your event trigger, accepting an input and then processing an output, now most of the time when you have that in place, you can't really chain functions together. Like function A can't call function B. If you were to do that, you, you can do that, but you, when you do that, you need like, things like having a state in between like queues or you need an Azure table to interface with function A and function B. So for example, if you're looking at having function A um, receiving an HTTP input and then triggering to uh, a queue, so it's saying that, okay, I have this state, send it to queue, 
another function picks up from Q and then carries on to function B, function C. You can do it that way, but there, there isn't much scalability in that sense. So and you can't run it for a long time, right? Because functions, they have, you need, you need some sort of state maintaining and whatnot. So doable function comes in really handy, handy where, where we have states uh, maintained within um, and it simplifies your, your complex functions into pretty much a couple of lines of codes. So again, all of this that we are talking about is all basically coding, right? You're, you're, you're looking at logic apps, but in a coding manner. So you basically code and interact how you want to orchestrate your functions from A to the last function. So, so again, what we're talking about is really advanced where you code um, your functions, writing it to run for a longer period of time your function now essentially becomes the orchestrator function. You orchestrate how your function behaves, how your function runs, um, and how your function interacts with one another. Your states basically are handled behind doable functions. And all of this is actually built on top, this thing called the doable task framework. So doable task framework is the one that allows you to do like things like um, checkpointing. So for example, if I run my function, orchestrating in the process, and then something breaks, there are checkpoints where you can then pick it up and continue running that process again um, wherever it last left off. So some basic fundamentals will be the function's programming model will look something like that. So if you have played with Azure Function, you have, you have looked at serverless itself, it is basically a unit of work, right? You have a very simple meta call, for example, like that. And that context itself allows you to then say, okay, I want this to be output into, for example, event, uh, every time it, 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 there's an event trigger, what do I do with it? How do I handle this process? And what do I do next? So all these functions essentially has a trigger. The trigger will either have an input binding or an output binding. Right? And then again, C sharp will look something like that, where you actually call Q trigger, you have a blob uh, to receive the Q, and then you have a blob output. So you can have multiple inputs and multiple outputs coming in and out of your functions to do the processing necessary. And these are pretty much some of the best practices that I, I would recommend, like having app insights. Now your function itself, if, if you're going to spin off a function, you want to know what happens to the function, what, what goes um, inside your function, whether what breaks, what's working. Um, and, and again, Functions itself, the, the trick is your function has to do one task at a time. But you want to do your, your task A, complete task A, do task B. And you don't want to do everything asynchronously and you realize that it's very hard to manage. So these are some of the, the, the best practices in the sense where uh, you want to trigger in batches, don't forget to catch exceptions. So a couple of things, especially if you're doing Node.js, right? Um, and that's what I figured as well when I'm coding Node.js, is JS has pretty much runs everything asynchronously. And if you don't use promises to handle like, like some of your function calls, you will end up having this race condition where function A tries to run this part of code and then it tries to trigger something else and it just messes up your entire um, logic flow. So again, having exceptions, having you know, making sure that you, you run synchronously within the function helps your function to work better. So again, of course, VSDS, release management, DevOps, um, one of the, the biggest conversation with a lot of companies is how then I integrate this with my production environment. And most of the time they say that I, I have or I do not have a Git repository, how do I go about doing it? And one of the things is if you're just focusing or if you want the organization to be focusing on the codes itself, then my recommendation is always have a release management of sort. Um, CI, CD in practice is really good where you have your code's written, um, have that checked in, and then the delivery pipeline for integrating with like your, your containers, for example, building up uh, your services, and then having that delivered down into Azure, um, and so on and so forth. So some of this um, basically is what Azure Function has this time. The runtime and languages, I'll just briefly go through is V1 is this. Um, we have running host running on V6.1. .NET 4.6.1, um, but now there's this is the new one, which is version two. So version two is a bit more exciting where right now you can actually run um, your, your functions locally. You can run everything out of the box. It's pretty much lighter in control. 
Um, and you actually have this thing called the function extension install. So function extension install allows us to install things like the bindings for like, for example, Cosmos DB, Twilo, et cetera, et cetera. And that allows you to interact with that extensions itself as a, a, a DLL library. So when I talk about function in, in terms of like, I want function A to do this, I want function B to do this, but function A, B, and C are all dependent, right? This is one of the complex scenarios where you might face some point in time. Um, some of the use case could be function A has to process a certain task. You want to send it to a queue. A queue will then get triggered off by function B and so on and so forth. This is where doable function comes into play. Same thing like fanning in and fanning out. So these are some of the doable function examples fan in and fan out and chaining, function chaining, where function A has to run. I send it, you know, have it, have its states hand off to a couple of functions to do parallel processing. Process like, for example, files, right? I receive a command saying that I need to process X number of files, all this runs through and then process the files, images, and, and so on and so forth. It hands off to the last function to do the video. So it's sort of like a map reduce um, methodology. So this with ng is the same. Yeah, so the concept of doable function goes a bit different from the normal Azure functions that we, we probably have played with. Azure function has your input and output bindings, your triggers and whatnot. Now doable function has this thing called the activity function. So the activity function basically runs the activity, like what do you need to get it to run? So in this case, I'm saying that, okay, I need this to, for example, say hello, hello, and, and then give me an output. And then the next is the orchestrator function. Now the orchestrator function, as I mentioned, doable function allows you to orchestrate your functions coming together. So in this case, what I'm saying that right now I have an output, I need it to do this call function, my activity, say hello. So earlier when we talk about activity function, this is what orchestrator does. It orchestrates your functions. I need to call say hello and then I'll pass in the parameter Seattle. So if you can see here, basically I'm receiving a string name and then if Seattle goes in, I output hello Seattle. So same thing, the next function that I wanted to chain is right after you call Seattle, call Amsterdam. So you get the idea, right? This is a very basic use case of what we call function chaining. So you're chaining function A to function B and function C without writing additional lines of code and still maintaining the, the whole um, concept of orchestrating this function in one orchestrator function. So again, functions, doable functions handles everything for you. Um, there's this thing called event sourcing where local state are appended execution um, history. So there's a lot of execution history that is actually stored within um, blob storage. Um, and then of course your tasks are all stored there as well. So this helps to improve your performance, your stability. And I, I, I think there's a couple of conversations that I'll be talking about later in the, in the last couple of slides, which is what about cold start, you know, how, how does task hubs run within, or how, what does the design looks like for doable functions. So with this being said, um, you get a full outlook of what happens to, or what is being run within Azure Functions and what exactly failed at what point in time. Um, and of course, you can look at the checkpoints that's happening within um, this execution history. So this is pretty much an example, orchestrator function, I have an activity function, and then the execution history. So right now, your orchestration has started. So basically you call that function and say that, hey, right now I need to start my function, right? I call it. It goes to execution history, say, okay, a call has been made. And then the task get executed or scheduled in the sense saying that, hey, I need to call, say hello, Amsterdam. Now, when this is completed, it returns the hello, so it returns hello, Amsterdam. And then, orchestrator will get started and then it goes back to execution history and say that, hey, this is started and then it returns the output. So this is pretty much what happens behind 
doable functions and how this actually handled end to end in, term, in terms of how um, your history is being stored, how is it sent, how is it maintaining the states and, and, and the, the checkpointing and stuff. So what I talked about earlier was function chaining, right? This is probably one of the examples of function chaining. Doable function has a couple of uh, examples on Azure that you could try. JavaScript is still in works in progress. C Sharp seems to be a bit better with uh, some of the components. So function chaining, <coughs> the problem is you know you don't have a visualization, visualization to show relationship between functions and queues. And in that sense, if I were to do this, I could do it um, with one function, sending the queue, and then handing, having that um, hand over from one another. Again, middle queues are implemented in detail, which means you have to handle those items if I were to do this. Right? Again, ha ever handling X small complexity. That means now I need to handle one function, handle the, the exceptions, for example, what, what, how do I do my retry policy? How do I ensure that um, when, I, when I message to function A, function A sends the message to Q, what happens if that point fails? So those are the things that gets a bit more complex if I'm not doing function chaining. This is what function chaining looks like. For which, which pretty much I showed you earlier in the in demo, where you're actually calling this thing called the doable um, orchestrator context, right? Instead of calling a normal context, now we're saying that this is actually a doable, doable function. The doable function allows you to then wait for function A to be completed, function B to be completed, etc., etc., and then it returns your end goal. What is the last thing that you want to return to everything else? A couple of other scenarios, which is um, what I call Fanny and Fan Out. Again, Fanny and Fan Out could be seen like uh, map videos of functions, right? So again, if I have one function, the function, for example, if I want to process multiple images, um, or maybe I want to split a PDF into multiple pages. How do I do that? My function A will then receive an image or a PDF. I send it in, it sends out to multiple or parallelizing this task into F2, function two. So function two will now be parallelizing my breaking up of PDFs, for example, into individual documents. And then I can then say that, okay, in this process, once you break up a PDF into page one, page two, page three, handle like extraction of text, for example. And then when you're done, output it, reduce that, combine it into function three. Function three has that combined version and then can return it as a completed, for example, converted to document, for example. So there are many different use cases in this case where you're looking at doable functions having that to run longer running tasks rather than having your functions to just die halfway and realize that, hey, it's not doable enough. So this is what it looks like. The main key that we're looking at is actually this part. Right? So this is the, the, the process that's running in parallel. So basically, I'm actually calling the function one but then at this point in time, the task that I'm running is actually carry out this execution of function two by parallelizing it across to ensure that all my tasks gets run at the same time and ensuring that you know, we reduce it at the, at the last point. That should be my output nicely formatted, nicely written, and then returning back to the user. So a couple more of examples would be the different patterns like async response, you know, you get a status, you do something, and you wait. Certain instances, for example, if you have a chatbot, then, you know, your chatbot needs to, to send an event, you're waiting for a human response, or are you waiting for an agent to respond? Uh, approval and stuff like that can be done within these kind of patterns. So let me move on. So, let me just Okay, so these are some of the outputs that you see, especially when you run a doable function. Um, there's this thing called, okay, so if you run an orchestrator and you say do work, it will return you a location of an orchestrator instance ID. Now this instance ID allows you to then query and ask, has my function been completed? Or has my function not been completed? So they'll, they'll let you know in terms of this status here. So it's able to tell you that is this pending, running, etc. But yet, at the same time, I could then say that, hey, I need to terminate this 
beforehand, before it was even completed. I need to terminate it for whichever reasons you could do that as well. So the, the orchestrator with this ID, instance ID, allows you to then control how your functions run um, and how your functions behave. And that means that now you have full control of the entire environment. So then you have actors um, where, you know, basically functions that are stateless and short-lived, you know, you have a read write to external state. So again, these are some of the new patterns that um, Microsoft has come up with, um, especially for doable functions and how you can actually apply them. There are, I think, about five or six that you can play around with. Um, for example, like SMS challenge, two-factor authentication. You need approval from a user before it gets triggered to the back end. So it's basically zero intervention through the whole process. So actors in this case, we are looking at this thing called the eternal orchestration, which is basically waiting for external events to happen. Now, in this case, when you wait for an external event to happen, you're actually saying that, hey, when I send out this function to run, I'm waiting for this function or this operation called operation. When this happens, then will you trigger the subsequent task that I need to get done? Otherwise, you wait. So in this case, when the function is waiting, it, you can see that it's actually just hanging in there, running as a state and maintaining that state long life. So there's no need to worry about things like concurrency um, and orchestration instances are pretty much implicitly you know, singleton so that they have one VMs at one time. So again, human interaction. So some of the examples will be um, you know, when you're, you're sending out two-factor, right? So like I mentioned, two-factor authentication. Um, your server actually handles this, request approval from a human being. Once a human being accepts it, what do you do? Process to A function or you process it to B function. So I'm going to show you this. Uh, so this is pretty much what happens behind um, Azure uh, doable function, which is called task hubs. So every function that you run has this thing called the task hub, which is inside your storage account. And basically what happens there is out of this, they orchestrate basically your entire operation, right? So you have your queue, you have your um, files, blob storage, and your table storage. Basically, every time you do an execution, execution history will be stored inside your Azure table. And every time when a task is being sent, automatically it will be handled by Azure Queue. So all these states that's handled back end, again, that will be actually handled with Doable Task Framework. Your functions will then be able to execute and having that long life, uh, long running task because of this infrastructure that's sitting behind um, Azure. So again, if you were to build your own, this is what you need to do, right? I need to have one Azure function, and then I need to have my own queue. Um, and of course, you need a table storage to ensure that everything's in state, and you need to control your, 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 your errors. You need to control the states that's going in and out. So all this right now, if you think about it, you can do it, but that means it's more complex. Reducing the complex, this is where doable functions comes in. Okay, I'm going to show you a quick demo. Okay, so <coughs> this is pretty much a demo of how it looks like. We have here hello sequence. So hello sequence, right? It's basically your orchestrator. So I'm now orchestrating a chain of calling uh, say hello activity. So I look at the activity, same thing, we saw this just now, but what's different is what's behind it. So for orchestrator function, uh, we have this function.js. So in your normal Azure function, you have uh, your function.js where you say, okay, function.json where you say I'm accepting an input binding, I'm doing an output binding. In this case, we're looking at specifically an orchestrator trigger. Now this trigger, 
basically triggers everything else. My say hello will be an activity trigger. So that's pretty much the two differences that you're building doable functions. So if I run this function, so if I run function host start, and if I go to postman, And if I run this, see basically returns me a instance ID. Now this instance ID, I can query and I say, okay, what's my status of it running? Um, how is my function doing and stuff like that? And if you look behind, it actually shows you that I'm executing say hello, and then it's executing the hello sequence again, and then say I'm running the next say hello, and then of course your first say hello will be here. So this tree say hello is running my my say hello Tokyo, Seattle, and then London, right? And this is pretty much what doable functions run um, behind. I've actually tried running doable functions with things like long running processes of scraping, for example. If I do scraping of a particular website, can I use doable functions to then pass the whole chain a point B, and then I do the processing in between, and then giving me an output. So in this case, doable functions can help me to have this task running like for a longer time period, without worrying that it breaks down. The next thing I want to show you is having this stored inside containers. So I think containers will be a pretty much interesting, but again, nothing fancy. So putting doable functions or putting Azure functions inside containers is pretty much just having a container set up. So what we need is actually to have a Docker file, a Docker file saying that I need Azure dash functions not lead. Now, if, if you've seen the Azure functions one time, that is deprecated already. So this is the new one where you say dash node eight, or you can call the ones for C sharp. What we need to do is we need to set the environment host name, which is basically saying localhost to port 80. Again, you can, you can decide, um, you, to map it later on. Then the most important thing is that you have this stored inside www.root. So you need to copy your files over into the site www.root. That's pretty much it. And then having a storage account set. Now what's different here is just that I have a www.root uh, and then my activity orchestrator sits within or inside this folder. So all you need to do is to do a build. So I really have a, so I really build it. I'm just going to run it. See, it runs exactly within the container itself and it's mapping port 5000 to port 80. So in this case, you can see that actually I could just have this container and deploy it anywhere else. And then I can have this skill, uh, whichever I need to. If I call it, so I have a uh, port 5000 and I call it, you see that I have an output and here it says that it started running my, my function. Now one thing to note, at least when I was building um, the overall function is, it's a bit trickier because you need to actually have this thing called the HTTP start. Now the HTTP start is basically a HTTP trigger that vaults to this thing called orchestrator. So you can obviously vault it to, you know, whichever name you vault it to. But having this in place means that now this will actually work, right? This is this is basically my vaulting. Why do I do that? Because now with HTTP start, it's then telling me that you need to accept a HTTP trigger first. When you accept a HTTP trigger, then send it to your orchestrator. Everything else is handled from there. Otherwise, your function will not run. Um, and you'll just be figuring out how come, you know, it's just not working. So again, a quick look out of what HTTP start looks like. Um, it's just starting your orchestrator client, and then it's just running the instance ID, you know, starting a, uh, and then having a check states. So these are just some basic um, codes to actually kickstart the doable function from HTTP trigger. 
So I'm going back to the slides. So this is again back to how the design looks like, um, the storage backend and how you scale it. So you have a control queue, which is basically the the queue where it controls your triggers from the orchestrator um, and the function execution. So every time when something comes in, it goes through this thing called the work item queue. And then it sends to the worker and it goes to control queue. It scales like that. So the blue one is basically saying that these are states that is actually controlled uh, and handled behind. Um, and of course, whatever stateless is basically your your queues that goes in and it's just gone. Okay. And then the history table. So every time it's executed, your workers run, it gets executed, it gets stored as an execution history um, into the history table. Some of the very core will be this, call start. So again, I think when I had Azure Functions talk last year maybe, um, there were people asking about what happens for call start, right? how long does it take to spin up Azure Functions. Back then, maybe it might take a couple of minutes. Right now, you have version 2 um, functions for C sharp takes significantly smaller. Looking at three to four seconds, I think today is about one or two seconds um, to spin up. And why is this so? It's because your functions are being kept warm state behind. Um, you don't pay for the warm states per se. You only pay for the execution that you run. So that's how um, doable functions is being built. Um, and how you can actually have, again, doable functions is a pretty much a subset of Azure function. You could write Azure function and have it stored or have it coded within containers and having it orchestrated with Kubernetes, Docker Compose, uh, Docker Swarm. The idea is, right now, is the, the industry is evolving. Um, people are looking into IoTH, serverless APIs, for example. These can be actually written, stored into containers or even running on its own from a Git repository, pushing it out into Azure Functions and having that as your API endpoint, for example, you actually reduce your IT cost. So instead of building up an entire infrastructure of microservices, you're now actually breaking up into this thing called the serverless architecture where you're actually reducing your components into smaller bits of functions, codes to be triggered and run. Um, and basically you don't have to be worried about, oh, what happens if endpoint A breaks down? Um, and then it affects everything else. Or, I mean, again, depends on design um, and depends on situation as well. So not all situations you run everything on serverless and expect it to run as magic, like, you know, magical tools. But this is some of the things that I'm sharing in terms of what you can do, what you can achieve with uh, doable functions, Azure functions, and how you can actually orchestrate all this uh, in one package. So that's pretty much the end of my session. Any questions so far? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. You want to go first? Okay. Um, if we change this, like, is there any such concept like possible to actually stream? Because, you know, like, if you fit one GB of data and this function takes and produce two GB of data before the second function contributes two GB, but some problem by nature actually you want to consume whatever already output by one function before even finish. Like, you know, like maybe splitting a big file by lines. It can be done line by line, but you don't know how, how, how long is the line for each. Right. So you just consume the byte until you find the limiters and then split it up. But if you have to produce temporarily to GB, it will be much slower compared to you can actually do it parallel. Right? Is there any concept that enables streaming of this? Streaming, no. So what you're looking at essentially is still your, your files being, or at least I'll put it this way. If you need the streaming function, there should be a streaming function, that, or at least a, a streaming capability is coming from an input stream. The input stream will still be writing into a blob storage or Azure files, or it could be a storage disk. That is where Azure function 
will then do the event trigger to event to, to pull that file out and then process it. So the whole point of Azure function is not to stream your data. If you need streaming of data, that should be handled as a, a separate stream processing there. But Azure function should be primarily be done in terms of processing that initial raw data that you have. So whichever raw data that you have, then you want to then process the information using function A, split it up, paralyze, uh, paralyzing all these tasks with uh, what we call fan, fan in, uh, fan out, and then fan in down. So fan in, fan out, process, map, reduce, breaking up the files, paralyzing it, and then having that stored eventually as endpoint B. Through the process, you might want to extend it in terms of, okay, now I have a fan in, fan out, how do I do another uh, function orchestration chaining? So C Sharp allows you to do sort of like this nested orchestration. Orchestrator A could be running your fan in and fan out process, but then you can then call the last end to do orchestrator B. So you're orchestrating multiple orchestrations together, where then orchestrator B can do function chaining to do other tasks. But in terms of streaming, I wouldn't recommend having, or at least Azure function wouldn't be able to do the streaming of files, but it's, it's more of picking up a file that's already been there, or an object or, or trigger event that's already been stored somewhere that you want to pull and process. Any other questions? That's there's something that um, I wouldn't know myself, um, but what I know is there's always a so basically the the function is sitting inside app service or basically sitting behind an infrastructure, um, and think of it as your application being keeping warm as in they are running your application all the time. So being warm or in this case they say pre warm workers is basically saying that. Your application, your function application sitting in an app, that, that um, application state is just being running 24-7. The only time that you need it is where they trigger, and you see, that's where cold start comes in one to two seconds, is when they call your function and it executes. But other than that, your, your application is basically just running without you paying for it. So Microsoft absorbs that cost while you pay for execution as you go. So that's pretty much what keeping your workers warm. It's just running an application 24-7. Yeah. Question. So what is the, the uh, size um, uh, and the uh, time it is limited for a maximum uh, function? Like like uh, maximum equal time out after this many minutes or millisecond or whatever, and uh, uh, this much of only of payload can be, can be sent. What is the limit of those? The current, okay, so for doable function, there isn't an actual time limit for it um, because your, the task is supposed to be kept or allowed you to run long, a longer time. So they won't actually die and you won't kill yourself. Um, for limits in terms of files, it's back to Azure storage, Azure queue, um, Azure table, whatever input bindings that you have, that is pretty much the limit of the service itself. Azure function itself basically just runs as an application. So whatever that it can take in, it takes in and it just runs. So in terms of timeout, doable function doesn't have a timeout because it's supposed to be kept uh, running at a longer longer process time and it's assuming that you need to churn and you need to run this task for a longer period of time. That's where you use doable function to just keep it running. Okay, so if it's running for a longer period of time, then the error handling or something has to be a part of the correct, coder correct, to handle it. Otherwise, correct. The billing will be more. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. So, doable functions. Again, when you code it, you are supposed to be doing your error handling, um, and of course, making sure that you are actually pulling up the correct information from your your source, your input source, and you're sending it out to an output source. Um, and of course, in between your 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 your, your functions, you don't have to be worried about what happens to my worker queues or um, the other states, for example, because those are handled by Azure. Uh, doable functions, they're handled with the framework itself. So all you need to do is my codes, I need to be looking at exception handling, error handling, and stuff like that. Just one more question. Sure. 
um, she support the workflow, I believe, correct? Yes. Okay, so it supports the workflow, and what are the runtime? I mean, like it supports non-Microsoft, for example, if I want to do for Python. Yes. And Python has lost uh, or Golang. Yeah. I'm not sure it supports. Yes. It supports? Yes. So, so I show you the earlier slides where we talk about language one time. Um, as of now, you have C sharp, JavaScript, F sharp, but Python, PHP, Go, and I think PowerShell TypeScript will be actually supported in the next one. Currently, we're looking at preview. That means you can still use it at your own risk kind of thing. Like, you know, there are still bugs, but you can still build on top of it. There's no issue. Um, if you go to Azure Functions one time, you can actually see that a couple of languages are already supported. You can actually just run it locally and try it. Um, the only thing now is because it's in preview, means that the development team are still building and firming things up there. So expected like breaking changes and stuff like that, you know, expected to have a not as efficient as it seems. Until it goes general av availability, then it'll be a bit more stable. But as to the timeline, when it's going to be a GA, I don't know. And the event trigger, I believe it's, it can be triggered event based. So when it triggered event based, is it like those events only supported of Microsoft? product or it can be any third party writing events can it pick it up what are the options available to trigger event based yes you can so if you have say like a webhook from a third party event right you could then link that webhook into your Azure functions through a HTTP trigger so we consider that as a HTTP trigger as long as not as typically like uh, some messaging queue third party or Kafka or kind of things no? yes and no providers available Yes and no. Some so there are a list of available triggers that Microsoft supports at this point in time. Uh, unfortunately, not all services are supported yet. So currently, you're still looking at some of the Microsoft services. At most, you get one or two open source that is being supported. But down the pipeline, they might have others. So again, doable function is allowing you to do the code only. If you want other event triggers that you need, then logic apps could be one that you can be looking at. So connectors and stuff like that. Any other final questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is a durable function, right? Can I get the partial, out partial output? So the function is written only one value, or suppose it's running long time, right? Suppose it's called CA. I want to get the A result. Instant, it goes to call the B. That means, right, it called the multiple functions. Yep. Each time I'm calling, I will get the result of what is done, the done result. Yes. So every time you run and execute it, um, the history is being stored inside uh, table storage, right? But you get the output in your output list and it handles accordingly to whatever your Azure function output uh, that you've basically set. Is that combining all the result and then return only one result? No. It is, it is sent as and when the function is done. It sends you back the output. So if you finish with function one, and then you're going asynchronous to function two, function one will return you, and then you, you receive function one. Um, again, depending on how you design it, most of the time you, you can return everything as one, or you can return one by one. You get what I'm saying? So Azure function, some of the codes, you can say that once you're done with everything else, give me a full output. That means within your console, you still see the individual output that is there, but the final output is, these are the done tasks. Uh, one more question is, uh, can, I, can I start with, suppose the service running and it's <laughs> breakdown, right? Yep. If the state is maintained. Correct. Suppose I want to start from that point. When, when you kickstart your doable functions again, or you kickstart a function again, it will automatically pick up whatever that is not done. So, for example, when I tried uh, writing some of these codes and I, you know, run it, I cut off the server. When I turn it on again, it will just picks up whatever that is not supposed to be done. Can I define the points where suppose it's uh, checkpoint? Yes, you can pick up the checkpoint. Say this is checkpoint instance ID. So it picks up by instance ID. You can say okay, run this um, at this point that was not run. So again, you have access to the execution history, you're able to see what are the checkpoints that are there um, and you can actually replay them and say that I need this out again. Correct. Okay, the Correct. The Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Cool. So can you split the execution history into multiple stories? 
can you split execution history to multiple storage? No. Um, apparently, that's handled by Azure function, um, and you probably don't have that control there, but you can then do additional output binding. So, again, execution history and whatnot is still handled, the states are, are handled by doable functions itself. You want to handle your own, then you have to do your own output binding to store additional history of whatever that you want to run. Otherwise, all these are still handled by Azure itself, and you pretty much don't have that control there. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, Nilesh is next.